Hello, everyone. We'll give everyone like five minutes to get into the webinar. Hello, everyone. Say hello, Rick. Hello. Hi, Sabina. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Enjoy the class. It looks like a factory. Get your boots ready to be rocked. <laughs> <laughs> Louie, come over here. Come here. Come here, Louie. Come here. Good boy. That's his beloved duck. Louie, come here. Oh, it's a He's walking on all of Rick's. <laughs> It's too nice out to close the window. You can close it. <laughs> Actually, just put your thing over there and I'll show them there first. All right. Almost ready. Let me look at the number count and see where we're at. My table's a hot mess, but that's the creative process. You know? um, let me get some water. I'm gonna just measure this over here on the floor. Getting a nice blast over here. Okay. Fresh air. No, I missed the call. I think so. Oh, no. Oh. Do it in the webinar. Can't leave a message with that. I gave permission that they could. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> so maybe. Oh, I don't know. Let me look up the number. It looks like. Shouldn't have turned the ringer on. That would be really soon, though. They said it would be a week. No, it's, it's so important that they reach me now. I mean, I'd be excited. No, I saw I had an ultrasound. <laughs> there was one. <laughs> that was the first thing I noticed. I'm like, oh, thank God, there's one. Almost <laughs> ready. Huh? Huh? Oh no, it's basement waterproofing Chicago. Oh. <laughs> they got my number from a home show. I tried to win stuff. <laughs> that was your first mistake. They're like, do you have a basement? No. <laughs> do you have any oh, water leaking? No. Stuff. You take lunch. I might even, Sabina, I might even give you some of the stuff to ruffle at some point. Sure. But if it's like right when you're lunching, let me know. And we might give one of you Rachel's phone to do the Facebook Live part. Hmm? Just we need like all kinds of stuff to do. Are you doing that at the beginning or end? Uh, like middle. Okay, I can. I'll prep. Yeah, the post. get the camera pointed. Because you prep it on here and then you just yeah, it. set off. Almost ready. There's Put a lot your mic today. On. You want I'm, I'm almost there. I want that old book. Mark Zuckerberg is live right now. What? <laughs> He's not in the webinar. 
expressing for the ballot. That's it. Good morning, afternoon, evening. Hello, everybody. Hope you're doing well. Let me get this stuck on. Um, I need a pin, a thing of pins. I'll oh, be what? right. Do I have a thing of pins up here? Oh, Rachel said I've got some right here. Thank you. No tape measure because the tape measure makes noise. And clip this. Clip this maybe here. All set there. How great is that? And then I got to clip this little thing. I'll probably run out of cord at some point today. Am I going to run out of cord? I can go a ways. Where are you trying to go? To the, over there? To the net, to the over there. <laughs> we'll have to mess with the cord a little bit today because um, my little like jury rigged thing uh, is only kind of working. You should have made it. I know it needs to be on a track to slide around. Um, it looks like we've got everybody who we're expecting. Yeah. So we're going to get started. Um, today we're going to like do a lot of stuff. So I, my goal is to like touch on a bunch of things and show a bunch of different things. And then um, you will get the recording, obviously. And as some of you have already seen, uh, we're still waiting for yesterday's recording to finish processing. But I sent you the one from the last time. So it's like a different time around doing the same thing, similar. And you'll see that there are some differences. And we kind of like adapt and change what we do all the time instead of saying like this is the only way to do it. So hopefully between the two videos, you can see that like even we change the way we do stuff from time to time. Um, here's what's happened in the night. And we're going to review this stuff. Um, we're making a kind of a rusty red pink and black tutu so I dyed the panty and we're gonna like we're not doing a dyeing class but we're gonna just kind of show you what we do um, and then the other thing that we did is we started dyeing some of the net which I'm gonna show you how we cut it why we picked certain lengths why we picked certain widths of net and then we're gonna show a couple different ways to ruffle and gather and then we're gonna start putting netting onto the panty but um, let me show you first the costume that we're making. Ooh, Stuart's laser cutting CDs, but it discolored them. How cool is that? We're laser cutting CDs to make wigs right now. Um, that's cool. Let me just tell them that's cool. We'll play with color, right? Um, so... I want to show you the sketch of what we're, we're actually kind of the tutu we're working on. And last time we just did white. That's why I grabbed my phone. Um, we're just doing a, a Spanish, just your straight forward kind of Spanish thing, but we're putting our twist on it. And we're starting with lots of like pink and creamy colors in the skirt. And then we're going to be airbrushing some different colors on it. So I'm not going to like do a ton of airbrushing with you but I'm gonna to touch on it just so you can kind of see how we're going from this to realization with this skirt. And one of those steps is we dyed, this is what Rick is working on. This is our top layer, the beginning of our top layer. And red is a hard color to get and so is black. Like even if you use synthetic dyes or acid dyes, red has a tendency to be kind of pink. So instead of like wrestling with the dye, we just embrace it and go, oh, well, we're gonna airbrush some. And so we started with this kind of with pink and yellow. And then over the top, I airbrushed a little bit of black and red. And this is gonna kind of ombre from black out to gold. So um, as this gets scrunched up, you can start to see that the top is darker and then it works its way out to yellow. And Rick is applicating kind of islands of lace on the top rather than trying to make the bottom exactly the same. We want, it, we want it to be a little more unique. So he's going to have gold and red, and then he's going to applique black chunks onto the top of this. And he's going to leave like an inch at the top so that we have somewhere to ruffle it. Then after it's all put together, 
we're going to take some of the black lace that he's working with and apply it right over the top because we want it to look like it's really deep and full and luxurious and we we also want it to look um not like numbers on a clock like we we tend to not have stuff be completely symmetrical but we have stuff that's balanced would be i say kind of what we're going for with this sometimes we do like perfect and symmetrical but this one we're just going for balanced and the other thing that we're going to mess with on this top layer is we're going to take a couple different colors of ribbon and we're going to put spokes of gold red and black coming down to help blend the color together and then i'm going to just because it's fun and we tried it yesterday we're going to pleat it with these chopstick spirals and just embrace whatever happens to our ribbons you know instead of trying to make them all on top or all underneath we're just going to see what happens so i'm going to give this stuff back to rick but how exciting is this going to be so we're going to have black spokes of different color it's going to look like a million bucks so let's get this back to rick okay. let's see let's talk about how we figure out our lengths and stuff next um there is an old book if you can get a copy of it, it which is hard to do it's called dressing for the ballet by lawson and revit this was published in like there's uh, there's a couple different publishing dates for it i think this one was like in 1948 might be the date of this one but it has a good um, set of info on just making a classic tutu. And it makes up more of like a powder puff tutu, like a, an early Karinska tutu. But we'll find out like if we can put this on the internet. I don't know if we can't because it's no longer published, but it's copyrighted. We'll see if we can find out who published it and get permission. But I can also just like email you guys these pages. It has their old kind of old school panty when the panties were made out of bobbinet and had no stretch and it ends up with kind of this pattern makes kind of a full budded kind of frumpy leg because the leg is also super duper long but it's good information to read in here and it also has a uh, kind of like where tutus you know from the 30s 40s and 50s kind of where the lengths came from that we use now today um, and they were making theirs out of silk tulle and starched bobbinet. But um, so they're calling frills what we call layers now. So the frill is the layer of netting coming off of the panty. And then the lines on the panty, we call that rows. So today we're going to be doubling some stuff up. So on row one, we're going to have layers one and two so that we don't end up with a panty that just has tons and tons and tons of thickness especially in the leg but this one um and i can scan these two pages and, and send them to you because it's good to see their frills go from one to twelve so this is a, a twelve layer two two and then they do something a little different than we're doing now but it's all based on 54 inch wide material um which is still kind of how we refer to widths of material so when we're going to railroad cut ours, we're going to say we're going to use four widths of 54. So we measure 54 four times and then cut it. But they, um, their frills kind of included what is more like a crotch ruffle too. Like you can see their frills go really low on the crotch, the first couple. And they're using one and a half widths of 54, then two widths of 54, then two and a half widths of 54, three three and a half and four and their um their widest things are let's see this one's in centimeters their widest is only 32 centimeters which isn't a lot because this is more of a powder puff tutu so this little chart here makes a tutu that sticks out 12 inches from the high hip and if, you, if you're only doing 11, 12, 13 inches from the high hip, you probably don't need more than four widths of 54. Generally, we do five widths of 54 
um, for 12, 13, 14, 15. If the tutu is 16 inches wide, like a lot of the Italian ones are really wide and different um, slave girls and Scheherazade characters and stuff have these really wide tutus. You might even use six widths of 54 at the top. Um, so you'll see that in this older book, they're adding more widths every time they go up the body. But generally now in a lot of the shops and a lot of the makers, they use maybe three widths for the bottom couple, four widths for the middle, and five or six for the top. Like they break it into like broader groups. And we, in our studio, we just cut everything with five widths. And then we only are sticking four widths on the lower layers. So our lower layers are going to have four widths of 54. And our longer layers, our wider, higher up in the tutu layers are going to have five widths of 54. And that piece of lace that I just showed you that Rick is working on, we actually cut six widths of 54 because we're going to do that chopstick thing. And I don't know how much fabric it's going to eat up. So when you're thinking about like how much do you want ruffled, think about how full and dense do you want it? Do you want it really luscious and full or do you want it more moderate and not full um and then we'll send you these other couple pages too they finished in these older ones they finished the leg with bias tape binding which makes kind of a thicker casing than just using the two layers of material um but it's good info to have and they're tacking a little different than we're going to but i can send you this information too on their tacking so this makes a real powder puffy tutu, or if you think of like the Red Shoes movie, this, this makes kind of that type of tutu. Um, not a great big flat one uh, like we're going for. Um, so let me just kind of make a little chart with you together. And we're just going to do like a supposed tutu. So some folks like to start um, with an inch and a half for their shortest width of layer we like to start with two inches just because it's easier and um on a great big stage nobody's looking that close so but you can decide what you want to start with so and we work from the top to the bottom so let's do a 10 10 layered tutu here so i just start with 10 9 8 7 6 5 4 3 2 1 so that's the top of our skirt is 10. And, whoop. and then the lower ones, are you okay, Louie? Woo! Have a peek, have a peek. Um, so the shorter ones uh, are going to not stick out as far, the lower in the panty. So this one is gonna be lower down on the crotch. So one is gonna be lower on the crotch, 10 is gonna be higher up. So I kind of first write down what my finished, what my beginning and what my finish is. So I'm going to say 15 is a really common uh, length for an, a dancer, um, like average height to taller dancer. She can handle 15 inches. So I lose a half an inch with seam allowance. So my top, I'm going to cut 15 and a half inches. And my bottom, I'm going to cut two inches. So this ruffle, when it's done, will end up being only an inch and a half. So we have a half an inch seam allowance in here already. And then I like the top couple to only be an inch apart. So the, the smaller the distance is between 9 and 10, 8 and 9, 7 and 8, the a little more support your top layer is going to have. And if our top layer was having really heavy decoration on it, I might go 15 and a half, 15, 14 and a half, just because the more net you have underneath the edge, the more structure you've got, okay? So I'm going to do an inch gap with my top. So I'm going to go 15 and a half, then I'm going to cut 14 and a half, then I'm going to cut 13 and a half. And these numbers might change, but I'm just showing you kind of how I approach this. Then I go up. So here we have an inch between, then I start with an inch and a half between my shorter lower ones. So I go two, then I go three and a half, then I'm going to go five, 
then I'm going to go six and a half. And I'm usually bad at this. Two inch and a half is three and a half. Four and a half, five. Six and a half, seven and a half, eight. Then I've got to figure out, is there something I can do that looks attractive between eight and 13 and a half? Or maybe do I need to like change my inch and a half here? Maybe I need to start off with like two inches, two inches, then inch and a half. So let's kind of keep going. So if we go eight, if we go up an inch and a half, it's nine and a half, 10 and a half, 11. Then we're going 11 to 12, 12 to 13. It's a little bit too abrupt. So I've got to monkey with my numbers a little bit. Some people like to figure out exactly what the difference is so that every row is exactly the same. But it's weird to cut like nine and seven eighths and then 11 and three sixteenths or something like that. So I just start from my top down, my bottom up, and then I monkey with my numbers. So I'm going to try, I need to get 11 a little closer to 13 and a half. So I might try two, four, six. So we have two inches in between, lower in the panty. And then I would have seven and a half, nine, ten and a half, eleven and a half, twelve, and then I get thirteen and a half. So those are the numbers I'm going to stick with. Does that, did that approach kind of make sense? Well, we just use it because it's like the easiest. Like we're skipping two inches down here, we're skipping an inch and a half up here, and then we're only skipping an inch as we get closer to the top. So as we move up the panty, the outside edges of the tutor are getting closer together. And I can just kind of draw that here too. So if we've got the side of our panty here. Yes, maybe I yeah, yeah. 54 inches, right? Because you were talking about centimeters in the book. Yeah, so the book, sure. we'll talk more about what 54 yeah. inches mean and what we mean when we say a width. But so what's going on here is lower, we're having a two inch space between our ruffled layers and then as we go up we're having a little bit less we're only having an inch and a half and then as we get even higher we have even less and structurally that helps hold stuff up so that's kind of my terrible drawing of what's going on there now um have I completely lost anybody or you're on board with what we just talked about? Just like one person give Rachel a thumbs up or a happy face and or just slap your keyboard. This is the quietest bunch we've ever had. Perfect. Okay. All good. So the other thing that we're going to kind of look at is you can like build shape into the tutu also with what gaps you're putting between the layers. So this we're going to look at more in the romantic class because um, we're going to do kind of a Degas style tutu. But if I want something that's more English, if I want more of a bell with my netting, I can have a, a, a few less layers and I can have a couple bigger jumps like that, maybe a little tiny short layer there. So you just kind of think about like, what is happening with the layers and how after you steam it, like you'll, you'll get to where you can kind of start to think ahead. Like, what do I need to do underneath to change the top? Like if I want an arc, I need some bigger gaps so that there's less holding up my building, you know, you know, less, less quality code in the building. And the other thing we're going to look at is when you're, when we're sewing this on our panty layer, if you sew all the layers going down, naturally over time, your tutu is going to droop that direction quicker, even if there's a hoop in here, and we're going to put a hoop in ours. So what we do, which what's funny is some people try to poo-poo it, but their, their poo-poo is that they say that Travis's shop does stuff more like the French do, and I don't think that's an insult. So even though people try to use it as an insult, we start with a couple layers facing up when we sew them on. And then 
we do a few layers facing down, maybe one more layer facing up and another layer facing down, so that when, when we have the, some pushing up and some pushing down, eventually when we steam and tack it, once it reaches to the edge, they're kind of like fighting against each other and make more of this shape. Whereas if you start with all of them down, over time it just wants to go down on its own. So we're starting with stuff that's a little more fluffy that we have to control rather than starting something with how we want it to finish. And the other thing is a lot of folks will steam and tack their tutu to what they want it to look like for the show, but by the time it's gone through a weekend or rehearsal, it's completely dead. So it needs to be like a little too glorious for the first week of the show and then it will nestle into what you want it to be finished like. Um, so that's kind of how we come up with stuff. So here's what I did for the two two that we're actually working on now, although I wrote my chart going the other direction. So one being my shortest, up through 11, the piece that Rick's working on is 11, and she's not super duper tall, so we're cutting the top 14 and a half, and it'll end at 14. And a question that comes up everywhere all the time is, for how high of a girl do you make that top? But that's something that you have to kind of decide how many girls are on stage. Are there like 400 girls? You don't want these gigantic things. You have to think about like how big is the stage? Like if we were cutting this for the Harris Theater, which is a studio space in Chicago, we would cut them a little bit smaller. But if we were cutting it for the Orpheum in Houston, like the snow tutus we made for them a couple of years ago, I think we're 16 or 17 inches just because the stage is 120 some feet wide. So you, that's also something to think about. I need to get in shape. Yeah, true. yeah. You, yeah, Rachel said also think about the silhouette. Like if it's completely flat, you might not make it as long. But if there's a little bit of a droop, you want a little more length to emphasize your droop. Um, but most average heighted girls, like five, six, seven, and eight, the top is usually like 14 or 15. And then you can go a little bit smaller for the short girls, a little bit longer for the tall girls. And I always tell people it's easier to cut some stuff off the edge if you're not sure than it is to wish you could add. So, so here's my, my layers, one, two, three, five, seven, eight, 11. Then I started with two inches, three and a half inches, five six and a half, eight, nine and a half, ten and a half, eleven and a half, twelve and a half, thirteen and a half, fourteen and a half, so that my top are closer. So we're the one we just did together, we had a two inch skip at the beginning. I was able to just do an inch and a half and then an inch. Then the other notes that you see are starting to happen on here is we're gonna double some layers. You're welcome to draw as many rows as you want on the panty and jam as many things on there. Not worth it. I've found through the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of tutus I've put on stage, it doesn't really change a whole lot. Um, so we're gonna ruffle one and two together. We're gonna ruffle three and four together. We're gonna ruffle five and six together, seven and eight, nine and 10. And we usually leave the top one or the top two all by themselves because we don't, we, we want to just pay a little more attention to how the top lays than the layers underneath. And you'll also see that I've labeled five and six are going to get my hoop. We're going to put a hoop casing in that. And even if you, uh, I learned when I was with Moan at Omaha Theater Ballet, even if you don't think your tutu is going to have a hoop in it this year, you might wish that next year there was a casing in it so that you can just slide a hoop in. And actually what we would do with all the, the costumes at Omaha Ballet, so there's my one layer, there's my layer that's a little bit longer, we would actually put in like two or three hoop casings because if, if you're in a smaller company and stuff has to get reused, if I move my hoop from way out here to in a couple inches, I can retack the tutu and make it a bell. I can change a flat tutu to a bell if my if I can scoot the hoop in. So if you have the casing already in there, it's much easier. Um, alternately, if you have a pretty flat tutu and you have another spot for a casing further out, as the tutu starts to lampshade or die, you can just put a new hoop further out and it will jack the skirt back up. 
Um, so let's cut some net together here. Um, that's what we're gonna do. Let me, I'm gonna just plunk a roll up here on the table first and talk about the different ways to cut. Um, and actually I'm gonna set two pieces of net up here. Oh, I know, right? I, I stuck my head in the fan the other day. It nailed me right in the forehead. And let me grab the Berenstein's sample book. Um, look behind that green folder. Is scavenger hunt hour. Um, we don't need this. We don't need this. We're done with this stuff. I'll do. Oh, yeah, the one that says color cards, I think. It'll all fall out when you lift it up, so be careful. You have to, like, pinch it and squeeze it. It's interactive. My piece of elastic did nothing. Um, we get a lot of our netting from Berenstein's in New York, and Oreo Textile is also starting to carry some different net. Um, well, this isn't what I'm showing you, but another good place is Preview Textile Group. You can get a page of all their different fabric types. So they, they specialize in silk and lots matching from one group to the next. So like you can get silk organza and then you can get the same color of silk jersey or silk chiffon that match. And then they send you, so this is preview textiles. This is like bonus inside info. Um, then what they send you, and I can't find it, is this great big sheet that shows all the different colors. So some of those, here it is. Is this preview? Oh, Spandex House. You can also get the like ultra lycra swatch thing from Spandex House. It All this stuff costs a little bit, but not bad. Um, how am I missing that color thing? Oh, here it is. So this is the preview color card. So all those samples I just showed you earlier, you can get in all these different colors. So you can get like teal silk charmeuse, teal georgette, and teal chiffon, and teal organza all for the same costume that matches. But what I want to show you in here is um, Berenstein Textiles is where we get a lot of our diamond net from. Um, and know that diamond net comes from China and that China doesn't necessarily use the exact same fiber content from week to week. So we just will dye a piece of diamond net from one roll and it will turn bright red or bright blue. Then the same fabric a month later might not suck up the same color of dye the same. So you got to be like flexible and adaptable. Um, but Berenstein's has some really great stuff. They have horse hair. I do this a lot today. There, there's other materials that are like horse hair cloth. You know, like there's horse hair you put in a tiara. There's also from Berenstein's a horse hair netting, which has got more sizing in it and the holes are a little bit closer. And then there's also another thing that's like really thick plasticky fabric, which is also called horse hair. So you kind of have to check out what that is. But they also have, so they've got diamond net. Then the other tube I have on my table right now is crinoline. And crinoline, you can't see this, but crinoline is much stiffer and much tighter than the diamond net. So whereas I see, I see often in the discussion groups, people will be like, the net from Italy is stiffer. Oh no, today the net from Italy is softer. Oh, the net from this place is stiffer. Oh, now it's softer. We just kind of know general that rule. general rule is have some really stiff net on hand, have some diamond net on hand, and if you feel like your tutu needs to be stiffer or last longer, put three or four or one layer of crinoline in and put a few less layers of diamond net in. Because um, it's not going to be the same from week to week. Um, the other thing that they sell that we use pretty often is um, Point Desprit, which is kind of a, a meshy tool, which looks really pretty on sleeves and skirts. And the other thing we get from them is English tool, which we're going to use in the romantic class. It's kind of stretchy and spongy. And we still railroad cut this stuff, but what we do is we kill the stretch before we cut it out. We make it completely grow, and then we cut it. Um, there's also one in here, stiffer than crinoline, that's called Can Can Net, which the square dancers use. It's, it's a little spongy. We don't use it really. 
And I think the other reason we don't use it much is the holes are bigger and it just doesn't ruffle with the equipment we choose to ruffle with. So we combine crinoline and diamond net. Um, and the, the diamond net you can get in a few of these colors on their color chart. And their color chart comes and goes, but know that if you call Berenstein's, you can like work it through and figure out what you need. And then also like there's different times where people say, oh, Berenstein's is only wholesale. Um, so I'd say if you're making lots of tutus, get a wholesale number. But sometimes, like if you just confidently call and say, I want diamond net in white or black or red, they will just send it to you. So there's some urban legends about a lot of these different places. And I think it's because sometimes people are like trying to help somebody in the people witness protection like program. Yeah, like, but you have to buy a bolt. That's yeah. good. Yeah, Rachel said you can't buy two yards. You have to buy full bolts of all this stuff. But I'm guessing if you need to make a lilac fairy tutu this year, that your deep purple lavender grape pansy and wisteria will all still be handy in three or four years. Um, so that and and they go in and out of having this color card. So we can scan this and send it to everybody too, just so you can see the the colors. And then the other fun news is we're having our own netting. Um, produced right now in China that's stiffer than diamond net, but not as stiff as crinoline. And if they can make the same stiffness happen for a thousand yards later this summer, we will be selling um, some white diamond net, which probably we're being told is special for us, but they sell to other people anyways, because that's how China works. Right, Tom? We have a China representative here today. Um, he's our China representative. So here I've got crinoline, which is on this narrower tube. This is 54 inches. So when we say widths from end from one uh, from one end to the other end is 54. Then I've got a roll of diamond net that's actually from textile warehouse right here. We're able to get pretty good diamond net right in Chicago, and we do find that that sometimes it's a little stiffer and sometimes it's a little thinner. So if it's a one of two, two, we just kind of use what we've got around. Um, but like if we were going to make 20, we would make sure to like make sure that we're doing the same thing on layer eight with the stiff net, layer nine with that net. You know, you want to be consistent. Um, so when, when people talk about widths of 54, actually, let me run and see if there's a bolt. Just see, grab any bolt or tool on that shelf, even if it's not netting. Um, people, or or net, is there ivory net, or up on the shelf, like the square bolts? Ra I put Rachel on a scavenger hunt. So there's different camps and approaches to how you cut out a tutu. I just do it the way I learned um, by people that used to do for San Francisco Ballet, some old Russians and some old Ukrainians and it seemed to work for them. Those are the best. But it also, you also have to be able to work with your material. And if you cut something on the cross or railroad cut it the long way, and you're like, oh, I don't like that, I don't think it works, then it may be that it doesn't work for that fabric or that it's just not your preference. Um, so grab me the green mat off your table, would you, Rick? So a width, this is a piece of cream tool or net. This is diamond net too. This is from Berenstein's. And I like how they like roll up the first and last few yards. Thank you. So when you're cutting on the cross, whoop, am I going to get it? I got it. We got big stuff today, big stuff. Um, and let me just kind of like look at my chart that I had made. When you're cutting on the cross, you have things to think about and everybody should like come up with their own way that they really, really like to do things. So even though this, this is a little wrinkled at the end, I'm gonna just, I'm gonna just chop it off and pretend like it's not, we would probably steam this a little bit or just throw it away. Like it's not worth the time <laughs> to adjust this, you know, if you're thinking hourly. Um, so I know, some makers that I've worked with, when they're working with the diamond stuff, um, they'll have somebody re-roll it so it all has another fold in it. 
so that you don't have to cut so wide. So you can re-roll it with a fold. I'm not going to be super precise in the effort to cover as much information as we can. So if I was cutting my two inch one on the cross, I cut my two inches. I first, do you see I, I trimmed off the garbagey edge? I straightened out my edge. And then if I'm cutting four widths of 54, I cut one, I cut two, I cut three, I cut four. Now you've got choices here. You can put all of your pieces end to end and, and overlap them when you ruffle them. You can overlap all your itsy bitsy pieces or you can stitch them together before you ruffle them, which I think when I have done it this way, which is rare, um, I've only cut stuff on the cross if I have a super spongy fabric, depending on which way the spongy quality goes. Um, and to me, this diamond net from Berenstein's cut on the cross is really spongy going across and it's, it's, uh, it's not gonna ruffle as clean as if we cut it with the length because my length isn't growing. And if I'm rolling pleats or making pleats, I don't wanna roll pleats that grow. So it's just kind of your choice and both are right. Um, but if you have little sections, you can stitch them together. You can also overlap them like three or four inches when you ruffle it. And that kind of helps it from being gappy. Um, but what, what, I, what I don't prefer is ruffling all the little sections separately and then butting them up. Because if you just butt them up when you sew them, you have all these like uh, trap doors flapping. So if you're going to cut on the cross, just overlap it when you ruffle it or stitch it together. Um, but stitching it together, I think, does take a little bit more time. And you can see the lines of stitching, but it's on stage and nobody's going to care. Um, so that's that's cutting it on the cross. And the other thing to think about is um, this is, if I take a piece of this, and this will be hard to see on camera. If I cut a piece of this, we actually, uh, Tal, who's Matt Orr's friend, showed a little demo of this, some makers in Israel. They're not making tutus, but they make poofy skirts to go under bridal stuff. When I scrunch this up on the cross and I start to smash it down, it actually starts to hold, um, as I smash this, the, the way it's, it's manufactured, it starts to hold the wrinkles and crinkles in it, where when we cut it the other direction, it's, it stays a little bit more perky. So if I scratch this up the other way, it stays a little more perky over time. And this net, this diamond net, bounces back a little bit more. And we like that it bounces back a little bit more because we're able to tack it into the shape we want and have it last a little bit longer. So that's kind of like the rundown on that. Um, so, so if you were cutting for our lower layers, let's just continue on with our notes here. So I'm going to say that halfway up our skirt, we want five widths and that we want four widths at the bottom. So I'm going to go, I'm going to say after our hoop, so below our hoop is going to be four widths of 54. And above our hoop is going to be five widths of 54. And our top one is actually six widths of 54. So, and this is a sloppy chart, but I can scan this too. So lower in the tutu, you need less length of net. Higher in the tutu, you need more length of net. Um, you could even say, I want to do three widths at the bottom, four widths, four and a half widths, five widths, six widths. But um, we just do four and five because with our ruffling machine, uh, what we do is we just cut everything five and then our lower layers in the panty, we don't scrunch the extra ruffle on, but our higher layers on the panty, we scrunch in a little extra fabric over the hip. And we'll talk about that too. If you put a little extra over the hip, uh, think about a marching band going around a corner. 
by packing extra over the hip of the girl, you keep the, the ruffle consistent on the outside edge of the tutu, because if you put it on evenly the whole way around, if your ruffle just is the same length as your panty, you'll have nice tight ruffle at the front, and then at the side they get really wide apart because you need more squished in at the hip to keep this the same. Because it's an oval, not a circle. Excellent, excellent, excellent. So let me cut out a piece of net and, and just kind of show you what we mean when we say rail cutting. But I already know someone has private messaged their buddy and said, they showed us how to railroad cut. I absolutely hated it. Have you guys ever done it any other way? No. No. It's no. just how we do it. There was a lot of no's. It's efficient. Um, it's efficient. I think that's just it, too, because I started off having to make herds of tutus rather than one tutu. Um, but what's great is if you think you're going to make more than tutus this year, um, when you railroad cut it, uh, one thing that I see people write down is they say, I'm left over with a piece of six inch wide, four widths of 54 fabric. Yeah, so you don't have to cut that one out for your next tutu, it's ready to go. Actually, go grab that box too. Um, that box that's right by Sabina. So I've got my big tube here and I'm gonna drop it to the floor because you don't need to actually see the fabric. And I've gotta untwist myself around the mic cord. Um, so what we end up with, this is like after three or four or five years of making tutus in this shop, we've got some tools, some English nets, some stuff, but we constantly are going from this box. So if we're making a tutu that's cream and white, you just go in here and go, oh, and everything is labeled. This is five widths of, of 54 inches and it's kind of maroony. We might stick that in a something. Um, this piece, this piece isn't labeled, so I'm gonna assume it's five widths. So we recycle the tool and net all the time. So when we have a leftover thing, half the time when somebody orders a single tutu, we, it's already measured in just a few cuts and it's ready to go. So that's super handy. So I'm gonna measure my five widths of 54 for the longer layers in my, in my skirt. And I have figured out exactly where on my body is 54 inches because there's yeah Rachel too like there's and we're we're able to do it like down to the inch if you were actually going to measure it instead of measuring it on a table so I know if I have one arm all the way out and the other one kind of like that it's 54 inches so I'm going to just pull off some netting first and then I'm going to measure it um so this is like one two I'm going to I'm do five two Oh, I'm not stretching this arm up. It didn't feel right. I have to change my angle. Yeah, I gotta go. One, there we go. Two, I have to pop my, three. Four. And don't freak out about being like 100% precise with this because it's just a great big bath sponge, really. This isn't rocket science. A tutu is a panty with a bunch of rectangles. I'd like to say we're saving lives through tutus, but I tell you guys, uh, Rachel I says that. It's, she says, it's just a tutu, you guys. So now I'm just slicing down, and I've got my layer free here. I'll just put this over there for somebody to trip on. It'll be me. Now, I've got the challenge of taking my long end and folding my long end in half. Rachel's actually the fastest at this. At how long per piece? One minute, 28 a minute and 28 seconds. She can fold all this up. Cut and fold it. Oh, that's pretty good. So if you're, if this is your first time, so I brought my two short edges in engines, my two short edges together, put a pin in it, and then go. And don't even worry about straightening out the bottom because you can do that later on. Like. We're, we're always thinking like, this is how we're putting food on the table for our families. I want some money left over. Can I speed it up and still do a good job? Oh, look, there's a flaw. A big old stitched in flaw. It's all right. It's decoration. Nobody's going to see it. And if you've got the kind of client that sees it, just fire them. 
right? You don't want that client. This is not to do with that, but yeah. have you been sending recordings each day or are you sending them? I sent everybody just yesterday. I sent because a couple, I'm one, one person yeah. Technical yeah, we'll, we'll send by the time this one's done, the webinar company processes yesterday's recording. So probably in my email now is the recording from yesterday and I'll forward it. And I've already sent people the original one. So I'll just keep sending them. But once we're all done, you will get six recordings. Day one, two different times. Day two, two different times. Day three, three different times. So I've folded it again. So now I've got my great big long thing in fourths. And when I was at Houston, uh, as soon as a roll of netting would come in, a team of interns would fold it all into four, five, and six width packets off of these big rolls, and they just hung on a rack because they're pretty much everything starts as white and then would get cut and then dyed and then turn into a tutu. So like on your days where you don't have anything doing, if you decide you like this and want to try it, you can just have stuff folded up and ready to go. And like when we have a group of tutus to make, this is the first thing we do. So I'm going to fold it in half one more time. So I've got my big, my big long thing, but I measured five times of 54, which is the same as cutting 54 the short way five times. I'm going to give it a shake. Short people can do this too. It's not just tall people, right? But we do have the upper, upper hand. It's our, it's our, our wingspan. It does make it impossible to get clothes. But Tom, our China representative, I'm making him try on all the clothes I used to wear in college that don't fit because he's skinny yeah, enough. I'm yeah, I'm going for <laughs> pants. I think he can wear some of my pants. This, this is also doable with tool, but in the romantic class, we're going to talk about like, there's some tool that's terrible, no matter which direction you cut it. So find better tool. Um, you know, sometimes that's the answer too. It's not the answer we want to hear, but. Tool is more often not cut railroad style, but we use a lot of the English tool. And our, we actually do romantics that are like a combination of net tool and English tool. And um, we, we railroad cut a lot of it. But the English tool will show you in the romantic class. And you can do it with regular tool, too. We, we stretch it all out so it doesn't grow later. But if you've started making a skirt, a tool skirt, and it's um, crawly or sticks to itself, then cut it on the cross and don't fight with it if that's what's happening. Like, use your judgment. Um, OK, so, so now I have my four widths my five widths, this is five widths of 54. But now to cut my different layers, all I'm gonna do first is trim up my bottom. Oh, do you have a scallop or a dig thing? Is there one over there at all? Even if it's the wooden one. Um, so first you're gonna trim that up. And then, you know, earlier I cut two inches, two inches, two inches, two inches. For this one, we only have to cut two one time. If we were cutting our two inch one, I would just go two inches. And that whole piece is done, ready to ruffle, ready to go. We don't have to sew anything together or overlap anything. So that would be my two inch one. I'll cut a three and a half inch one, but I think this should make sense. So you can cut it either way, but we cut it this way for, for more than one reason. Uh, the second reason we do it this way is it's a lot faster if you choose scallops or dags. And you'll find that like some artistic directors say that every tutu is scalloped no matter what. Um, some say that everyone is dagged no matter what. Some will say dagged is reserved for Swan Lake. It doesn't really matter. It's if you like it, you know. And actually, I think uh, looking at a lot of the old tutus at the Houston Ballet Storage, um, I think often, other than Swan Lake, they were scalloping or dagging to blend colors together. So if you have like a red row and a pink row and a yellow row, and you don't scallop or dag, 
you'll have like a bullet underneath a, a bullseye. But if you scallop them, it helps soften the edge and blend the colors together. So it's really if you want to. And we have these rulers, these scallop and dag ones available in acrylic um, on our online store. And actually, I need to send out somebody's hip ruler. For anybody in Australia, we're experiencing all kinds of trouble with the US Post Service getting stuff from Chicago to Australia. They've changed a customs form in November and the station where stuff goes later in the year, they're not all on board about which form it is, whether it's the new form or the old form. And then stuff we send to Australia just sits and sits and sits and then it comes back to us. So Leanne, if you're listening, I think your rulers are held up, but we will get them to you. So I just marked my scallops on there. And now that this is already folded up, I'm cutting the scallops for my whole layer at the same time, rather than cutting a small layer and a large layer and a large layer. The other thing you can do is like, you could even fold this in half another time and cut even more at once. But that, that makes it a lot easier to do this right now. Should we, should we relocate over to like the little die corral and just show that a little bit? Mm -hmm. We also have a webinar day where we airbrushed and dyed or just dyed? It's an airbrush one and a dye. Skirts day. If, if anybody like doesn't get what I'm showing you really quick and you're interested in more airbrush or dye, just let us know. But I think like the idea should totally make sense. If you just point the camera over there and I go over there, I feel like Bob Barker, I've got to like, back when he had a cord. Yeah, I mean, this elastic from the ceiling is great. Um, let me grab my little white packet. So right, I just had a, I just had a packet of white netting. Um, and we're, uh, we already know that red is hard to get. So I just shot for pink, because we're gonna airbrush over it. But I'm gonna leave some of the pink, because if you've got, if you have different things going on, like highlight and shadow wise, the tutu will look fuller and richer. But what's great is with these packets already put together and pinned together. So this is my layer three spoke. And we um, we always call this brick dyeing because when it's put together, whoop, I've reached the end of my cord. Am I still plugged in? No, I'm still plugged in. You can still hear me? No, I'm good. I'm good. It's like, it's like I'm on a bungee cord or something. So we will dye stuff in a way so that when it's ruffled, the colors aren't matching. So like when we ruffle this one, we're going to not put the yellow on the yellow side unless that's what you want. Because you can make a tutu look like it has spokes of color the whole way through the skirt by always putting the yellow on one side and always putting the pink on the other side. When you ruffle it and sew it on, you have to pay a little more attention. But for this one, we're going to offset it so that the colors just kind of watercolor and blend up the skirt. And then after our layers on the panty, we're going to lift up some of them and put little bits of red in there. And then we're going to airbrush the very top with a little bit of black to kind of blend it all together. Um, and all we're doing is using a, a turkey roaster, which we started doing because our friend Patty in Canada uses a turkey roaster. And we just love it. You can heat up a lot of water really fast. Do you need anything? You're good. Take a break. Have lunch. Have some coffee cake. Um, but I was getting flecks in my blushy pink color. So all I did this morning, instead of like waiting for it to get super hot and the flex to dissolve, is I just laid a piece of muslin in there, a wet muslin, to push all my flex down. And then I was dying inside that. So I've actually got pinky, peachy, red, and yellow mixed up. And then with your packets of net, you can just fold a whole assortment of shapes. So like you can fold it like an M, dye one side of your M one color, dye the other side of your M another color. And then when you open it up, you get like the more folds you put, the more very uh, variance you get between the two different colors. Did I lose anybody on that? Like we're not doing a dye day, but I just wanted to show you that. And no to earlier how I was saying, 
that fabric isn't the same from bolt to bolt. They might be using more nylon or more polyester or told you it was all nylon. You won't know. You won't know <laughs> until you make a tutu that's this color this week and the next week not a single color will stick to what you think is the same fabric. And we mess with acid dyes, which you add vinegar to. Regular RIT usually just works the best. And then we also use the RIT synthetic, which doesn't seem to be a whole lot different than regular RIT. You can add vinegar, you can add salt, you can try different stuff. Um, but that's why we use a combination often of dyeing and airbrushing. So that we like kind of get some color on there and then like put more color on it with the airbrush. Um, and I think I can airbrush a little on it tomorrow too. So is it time to like start making some ruffles? And the hoop casing. Let's, let's talk about hoop casing. And that's a handout. I can send you a hoop casing handout also. Um, on my little sheet there, do you see which numbers I said my hoop casing is? Right there where your hand is on the... Five and six? Yeah. Five and six. So I'm going to see if I can reach five and six here. I'm at the end of my cord. <laughs> I can do this. Okay, I got more length. Five and six. So you can also, we, these are straight pinned together to kind of manage. These are straight pinned together. <laughs> I'm always looking at myself. These are straight pinned together to kind of manage the netting while we're dyeing it. You can just swap these with safety pins and throw them in the dryer with a dirty old towel. Um, if you don't have a craft dryer, you'll just tint the outside of it. It wipes, um, off. It wipes off. Yeah, or we've also just put bleach on a towel and thrown it in the dryer and cooked it when nobody was around um, so that you don't gas yourself out. I mean, we've also dyed stuff at the laundromat and ruined their washing machines and then just hid. The trick is to put your dye in detergent bottles so they don't know what you're dumping in there they think you're just really using a lot of detergent brown um detergent. brown detergent they stole your clothes though, so. yeah they a lady at our laundromat stole my dick blick shirt from like 2007 was a dick blick anniversary and i turned in my laundry to get done and then later on i found the lady wearing my very specific missing shirt um, that's your high maintenance. That's my high. The laundry lady stole my shirt. I know she did. Um, I'm gonna just use whatever Bob and I've got. So there's different ways you can make a hoop casing, and I'll talk about all those right now. Um, one way is called an applied strip. So wherever you want your hoop casing, so the further out, I'm drying up. The further out your hoop casing is the flatter and perkier your tutu will be. So we try to put it somewhere in the middle because um, we're going to control the shape of our tutu with tacking. Um, I just didn't have my machine threaded. Um, so the applied strip hoop casing, you can just cut a strip of net that's like two or three inches wide and wherever you want it on your layer, you just stick it down and stitch both sides of it. So you're applying a strip to the netting. And I, I can send a handout on all three of these. Um, the other one, and I can, I'll show it with a piece of net. I shouldn't turn the light on, right, Rachel? It'll be too bright. I'm old, I can't see this without the light. Okay, so one is like sticking a strip right down the middle. So if this was my, my layer six, and I want my hoop casing, actually, would you hand me layers eight, or actually layer five, if you can find layer five down there. Um, so if I want to do the applied strip, I just take a strip of netting, cut it the same. So if this was my strip, I would just cut a strip. Is there no five? I think it's the one right at your foot. Oh, I have five. Hand have me five. four. Hand me four. Give me layer four. Sorry. So the applied strip, you'd open all of this up and do just what it says. You'd apply a strip on here. This one's a little wide, like two inches is usually enough. And you'd stitch both sides of that strip 
and that space is where your hoop, where your hooping will go. So that's number one. The other one is to make a fold. So if this is my layer six and I want the hoop in it, and let's say layer six is 10 inches wide, what I would do is instead of cutting layer six 10 inches wide, I would cut it 13 inches. So now let's together imagine this is 13 inches. Then to put your casing in, you're gonna just fold back your layer and stitch only one time. So you would fold back, this is to put a casing in a fold. So now your layer ends up, you added three inches, but we took away an inch and a half and an inch and a half. So now your layer ends up being the width you want it, and then underneath your layer, haha, -ha, you've stitched and you have a little tunnel there to put your hoop casing in. But the method that we're going to do today is where we're just going to take layer six. So our hoop casing is going into layer five and six. I'm going to take six and five, and I'm going to first stitch their short edge together. And then I'm going to figure out how far over to put one other single row of stitching to put my hoop into. So once your hoop is opened up, you don't need to make a channel that's only like an inch and a half wide or two inches wide. We're gonna have a great big channel or pocket to slide the hoop in, because your hoop, it can only go so far anyways, and it's not gonna get smaller. The hoop isn't gonna slide in. And the nice thing with having this big space is if you decide your tutu's too flat and you want a little bit of bell, you just untack a few things so you can get to your hoop casing, shrink the hoop, and just make sure it's an even amount away from this stitch, and then tack it back down. And then now you can make your tutu droop a little bit. So we have layer five and layer six, which might not even show up because they're so see-through. But the reason I wanted layer four was so that I can figure out how far, what's the maximum distance away from her hip can I put my hoop case? So I'm gonna lay layer four here, and where I put my pin is where I kinda thought, but it's too far out. So you have to think that you want the layer under your hoop casing to disguise your hoop casing. And we usually go like an inch and a half or two inches in. So if this is layer four, on top of layers five and six, my hoop needs to be recessed under layer four. And for me, instead of like doing math, it's easier for me to just see how wide layer four is and decide how far in my hoop casing is going to go. You see, so now I've got my hoop casing recessed. So when it's all gathered up, you'll still kind of see it, but four is going to cover it up a lot. So I'm gonna start by stitching the edge I'm gonna to ruffle together. Cause I know that on our fancy ruffler, on a Johnson ruffler, on a ruffling foot for a home machine, it always slides the bottom layer under quicker. So we wanna just quickly baste these two edges together. So I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna quickly baste my two, what am I, I don't even know how to use this machine. Um, is it on? Okay, so I'm going to just with a long basting stitch and no zigzag put my edges together. So this is the edge we're going to ruffle. And I know that it's going to get ruffled, so I'm not even being like uh, super picky about getting this absolutely matching. Because it's a big bath sponge. A fancy bath sponge, but it's a bath sponge. And I should mess with my tension, but I'm not going to. And it's just a big scratchy mess. So you might want to wear long sleeves. So if I was, if I had cut on the cross, the short side of the fabric, I'd stitch all my short edges together on each layer separate before I put the hoop casing in. So 
So I'm just kind of like arranging it as I go. So earlier too, I said, we just cut five widths because um, we, on our shorter, on our lower rows in the panty, our shorter layers, we just lay it down as ruffled as it is and cut off what we don't need. It's faster than trying to keep track of four and five width pieces. And us cutting five is easier than cutting a four and not having it be long enough. Um, there's also, there's a maker I know who isn't, he used to have a shop, Tom Peterson. He had a shop on, in the Northeast. They had several different ruffling. They had a ruffling machine similar to a Johnson ruffler and then home ruffling feet. And they would actually band saw tubes of netting to make their two inch. They'd tape the tube, cut it with a band saw, but you have to like really tape it really tight or it will explode. And they knew that on this machine, it made their short layers. On this machine, it made their longer layers. And on this machine, made their top layer. So they didn't, if they were making white tutus, they would just ruffle miles and miles of white and know that from whichever machine where it went on the tutu so that the top was fuller and the bottom wasn't as full. So lots and lots of, ooh, I went a little cry. I almost sewed my thing. I keep thinking I'm surging. I'm trying to lift the foot pedal with my foot instead of my knee. So this is boring, but I'm almost done. Today we're going to get to ruffling, and then tomorrow we're going to show connecting it all together. Actually, I might put a few layers on the panty today just so you can be thinking about that too. We do? How many? Oh, we've got more time than I thought. I thought we were down. Further. This is long. It's taking a while, but I'm just going to finish it. My attention's a little off because I'm going super fast, but it's going to get ruffled. Who cares? My friend Sandy in Houston would say, this isn't brain surgery. What? Oh, show everybody. Ravioli. We just got an email from the shelter where we got our dogs begging for some more adoptions. If I had room, I'm not going to be the cat lady. I'm going to be the rescue lady. About 40 dogs, that's my limit. Oh, my God, this is taking forever. I'm going to just wow. do part of the other part. And then with the magic of elves. The other, the rest will be finished. Um, no, I'll sew on some of this. We'll give it to Tom. But hooking this edge together now, for me, is easier because it's going to ruffle without me having to line so much stuff up. And I kind of got wily seam allowance. And then, because the feed dogs are moving the bottom faster, I have this like six inch difference. Just cut it off. It's not worth trying to make it match. So now, back at my beginning, we marked where we want the casing to end. Oh, it fell off. So here's my four. I want my casing to be about an inch and a half underneath four. Then you can like lay this all out on the table and pin it, or you can just like figure out what you're lining up to what. Um, 
I'm figuring out. So you can't see this, but I've got my short layer in this gap in the table of my machine. I'm just, I just figured out like some point that I can look at to line it up. And I unthreaded the machine. This hard with no light. Not, no, it's just, it's too bright on the camera. Good, I thought I was gonna have to turn the light on. So back stitch here, you know, you don't want it to come undone. But what I showed you on the paper earlier is you could put a line here. Then if you wanted to put a line in the middle or a line further out, you can adjust the hoop. But I find with this great big gap, if you just shrink the hoop and tack it, you don't really need the other channels. But when I first started at Omaha Ballet, we would put the other channels in. So now the trick is to not end up with big twisty things. So what I do is I, as I'm going, put a pin. I put a pin every now and then so that I can make sure my top or bottom isn't getting ahead or behind one or the other. So I would just continue on and put this second stitch in. And once this is all gathered up, this is gonna be my hoop casing that we're gonna shove a hoop into tomorrow, okay? Is everybody ready to make some ruffles? Would you grab me a metal fork, please, yeah. Rick? Um, so, let's see. There's lots and lots and lots of ways to do this. We're gonna show you a few. Um, the one that a lot of people do is they zigzag over a fishing line. I'm gonna zigzag over a piece of high mark, which is just really sturdy, kind of like carpet thread. Um, everybody should know if they're taking this class, you can also stitch two base, thank you. You can stitch two long basting stitches and pull them and gather. Maybe I should do that, I'm assuming. I'm assuming. So if you really want to make, you know, try to impress your, your friends that aren't making tutus and won't be impressed, what you can do is stitch two rows of gathering stitch, like you're gathering a skirt. Stitch one row. I'm going to just flip it around and stitch the other way. You'd stitch the whole length with one row. the whole length with the other row. Sometimes if you loosen your tension, it will help. Read what your sewing machine book says. Separate these two threads. And pull them like you're gathering uh, for a doll clothes or a sleeve cap. That's one way, super easy. It takes a little while, but it makes a really nice gather. And by having the two rows, you have a nice place to stitch in the middle. It keeps everything really arranged. If you were doing this, divide your netting in half or quarters and put a pin in your big long layer before you gather it so that you know where the center and sides pretty much are of your skirt because you want to you wanna know where the middle front is for sure, the center front. So that's one. The next one that a lot of people will do is to zigzag over a piece of fishing twine, but I'm gonna zigzag over a piece of high mark. I, we always called it fishing twine growing up. Yeah, what else would you call it? Fishing line, oh, I'm from a farm. We called it fishing twine. You know, there's bailing twine and fishing twine. Um, when you're doing it over the fishing line, put a safety pin. Do I have a, do you see a safety pin anywhere? Um, Put a safety pin at the end because otherwise it's all going to just run off the back side. So if you're going over a fishing line, put a safety pin on there. Put your fishing line underneath there. Put your line on top of your net. And I made a zigzag with my machine. And just play with what size zigzag is working better. If it's too small, it's not going to work. Then you can either have a great big long piece of fishing line, put or high mark works great too. Regular thread isn't any good, it'll snap. 
you can put a big long piece of fishing line in and then pull it or the times I've done this, I like to kind of pull it. Oh, I'm gonna catch the safety pin. I like to sew a little bit and then pull my line so that I'm scrunching it up as I go and you're less likely to have snags later. So you can just be more mindful of your seam allowance than I am. And see, as I continue to pull the fishing line, I'm getting a gather, a scrunch. So that's zigzagging over something and pulling it. There's that, like that. So how cool is that? Um, for tool, or if, you're, if your bobbin can handle a sturdier thread, so this takes a little more arranging, right? Because it wants to, it wants to like twist into a rosette, but it totally works. I know um, one of the gals that I worked with at the Joffrey, she would do this over the fishing line, mark or middle, and kind of zhuzh it to, you know, have the same amount of gather on each side. Then, then before she'd go to the skirt, she'd go back and do another wide zigzag, just to keep this laying a little bit flatter so that there's less to wrestle with at the end. So, so you can also go back and kind of flatten your seam allowance down a little bit with a zigzag. Another one, pull up, oh, I'm out of bobbin. Take a bobbin, oh, how about purple? Um, another one, this works better with tool, or we use Tex 40 thread, which is heavier duty sewing thread. It would probably work with our thread. Like dual duty and Coates and Clark thread is usually like a 27 or a 30, which is really like a weight that you should surge with. So we like 40, 40 threads. Um, you can pull it out after you've zigzagged it on your layer. It's like, it's kind of your call. I think it's too much to leave the fishing line in. Another one is take a piece of long bobbin thread, pull it out. So if the row on your panty is 32 inches, pull out like 36 or 37 inches of bobbin thread. Let me get a new sample here. And then you put your bobbin thread in. So it needs to be longer than your finished row. So now I'm just holding my bobbin thread and I'm zigzagging. This works great with tool. It also works with math. So now I'm just holding my bobbin thread and I'm letting out a little, it really wants to curl. I'm just letting out bobbin thread as I need to and I can just keep scrunching it up. So how slick is that? That is zigzag over a bobbin thread. Make samples of all and then figure out what, what it is you really like. But that too, so like our 40 pound thread, you can pull on that pretty hard. But um, if you have an industrial machine and you can put high mark in your bobbin, you might also want to try that. It's just every machine acts so different from, from you know, day to day and brand to brand. So that's zigzag over a bobbin. Another one that pops up, and actually this is how my dad's mom would make bed skirts. So I always wondered why she sewed with a fork, but now I know. Another one, and for us, it's not full enough, but everybody is doing things, everybody has different needs. So I'm taking a short tine in my fork and flipping it over, and then I just use the fork to hold it. I'm gonna leave it on zigzag, but you can do straight stitch. So I'm just pleating with a fork. So right now I've got my pleats butted up to each other. Oh, I did put it on straight stitch. I'm gonna leave it on zigzag. But what you could do to make this fuller, instead of letting your fork pleats lay side by side, is to actually start to overlap them to make it tighter. So instead of having just the layers of one fork pleat, I'm like overlapping two fork pleats to make it fuller and fuller and fuller. So play with, play with the visual of it. 
there's no one way to do this. There's even some YouTube videos of people doing some different pleats. If you just look up tutu pleat, there's, there's a lot. So I'm doing two fork pleats now on top of each other. Um, I know one gal that she twirls her fork. She starts further down and goes one, two, three to make a roll, a bigger roll. So you kind of have to figure out like where to put your fork. And I think if I were to use the fork method, I would do three. One, two, three, and then go. That looks the nicest, doesn't it? So I'm figuring out where to put my fork. One, two, not far enough down. Really, if you are like into this, you'd figure out where to put a piece of tape on your sewing machine and where to start your fork. I see now I'm now I'm like trying to figure out where to start my fork. Then you know that you're going to end up, oh, I'm almost there. That, you know what, I actually, this is kind of fun. So, but I think if I were making a tutu, I would at least need three of these. And you're probably going to need six or seven um, widths of fabric. Let's do a couple with only two. Oh, two, but you're going to have to, two, right? Here's what happens with two. If you do one, two, your fork is upside down and you got to pull the fork out. But that's, it still works. So experiment with it. Like know that like I don't know the answer right now. And my answer would be to tell you to like play with it. But definitely you're going to need more than five. So that's doing it with a fork. Um, some makers, I know at the Ballet West shop, they just use their hands. It's so dry in here. They do what I call a hopscotch pleat where you do two knife pleats stacked on top of each other and they sew their two knife pleats, and then they put two knife pleats the other way. And it's just because that's the, the look that their, their you know, shop manager has messed with. Some of the ladies in there too just do knife pleats all the same direction. And there's even some pleats, and this one, um, where you can take and pin them all ahead of time. Like you can fold up a big section of net fold it up and fold it back so that you're getting like one, two, three, four, five, six, six, a six to one ratio for every one pleat. We're taking away six lengths of pleat. So that one you, I'm folding up more than I need and then folding it back and fold. What did I do? I folded it up and then I folded it back two times. And play with trying different directions too. Like it's it's up to you. Invent the Vanessa pleat or the Gertrude pleat or the Howard pleat. Some folks too will do two knife pleats coming towards them and then overlap a single pleat right over the top of that. So it's really it's really it's really up to you. Um, Let's show some more. Look, I, it's like Lady and the Tramp. It's running from this sewing machine into the ruffler. Um, should we do our Facebook Live moment? What are you showing? The Johnson Ruffler Basics. Yeah. I think. Do it separate. I think separate. Separate. Yeah. Well, but I'm going to well, just show you the Johnson good. Ruffler, but later we're going to make a Facebook Check Live because a lot of people have one and they've been so frustrated frustrated with it that they say they don't use it. We can give you some pointers. Yeah. Um, but I'm going to really quick do a little on the Johnson Ruffler. So the Johnson Ruffler is like a home ruffling foot. So in a minute, we're going to put this on the home machine. Um, it has a blade that's pushing the netting and then the needle is catching the pleat or the scrunch. Like this doesn't really make pleats, it makes shearing. It's like a shearing machine um, or it's a ruffle. Um, so things that happen on this gizmo and the Johnson Ruffler, like you have to be like a little bit of a mechanical engineer here. If the blade is pushing your fabric forward and your needle is already coming back up, it won't catch the fabric that's pushed forward. So that means that you need to figure out how to get your blade further forward. So on a Johnson Ruffler, there's things you can adjust to push the blade further forward. You can also adjust how far forward the blade goes. So right now my blade isn't going forward, and this is an old thing. But if I bend it so my blade goes further back, 
the further back my blade goes, the more fabric it's scrunching in. So then, similar to this and the Johnson Ruffler, you can mess with the stitch length. If you have long stitches, your scrunches will be further apart. If you have short stitches, they're closer. So I've got a long stitch now with my blade all the way back. It's full, but it's not super full. If I lower my stitch length, my blade's coming the same far, same distance back, but my stitches are tighter, which means more scrunches per inch. So you're able to really scrunch it down just by making a shorter stitch length. Then you'll find there's the stitch length that's too short where everything jams up in the needle brace. So, so there's that. So now let's look at the, the home, the home home machine. And did you hear like my Johnson ruffler goes, nuh, nuh. it's really common on a lot of them. Like the little motor isn't strong enough for what's going on. So now I won't be able to make it do it. So if it's not going, you just give the wheel a push and it will go. Um, let me use this piece now. Oh my God, there's so many different things. I don't need to show the chopstick one because everybody saw that on Facebook the other day. If you, if you haven't, yeah, just look at our Facebook page. So the chopstick is a version of the, the chopstick is a version of the fork, only we're making this really pretty little twirl um, instead of a pleat. It's more like a little tunnel of pleat pinched between the chopsticks. Yeah. Um, so let's do. Let's look at this foot since it's what we were, were just talking about. On here you'll see one, six, 12, and zero, and most of these are the same or they're made by the same person. If you put it on 12, the little cam rotates 12 times before the, the blade pushes forward. It goes one, two, three, four, five, six, nine, 10, 11, 12. If you put it on six, it goes, one, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. You're gonna wanna put it on one for making two twos. And I don't know why there's a zero. I guess that's if you wanted like a little straight spot and then a gather and then a straight spot and a gather. Like if you're making a ruffle for a Marie Antoinette dress. Then the other thing it's got is this little um, kind of carabiner shaped thing that's got a hook onto your needle bar. And we have a non Bernina one with a Bernina adapter foot. So you also kind of have to like see if your machine guy is trying to scam you or if he'll just sell you the, the fewer things you need instead of, you know, the expensive thing. Um, so I'm gonna start with a long stitchling and they're gonna, it's not gonna be as tight. So I'm gonna go. And there's all sorts of like little guides you can play with like, oh, I wanna put it in that slot or this slot. Oh, I'm gathering the wrong end. Can you hand me my scissors, sir? Oh, Don't gather the edge with the scallops. Whatever's going on there. Don't backstitch with this thing. Um, so, and you have to make sure that you're like in the right part. And there's, there's YouTube videos for this stuff too. Um, so like it's kind of ruffled, but I know it's not tight enough for a tutu, but I can get away with a little by lowering the stitch length. And the lower my stitch length is, whoop, whoop, whoop. The lower my stitch length is, the tighter I can get. And if you wanted more seam allowance, don't go in the little guide. You be the guide. And ruffle along. Um, this gizmo, usually won't get it completely tight enough, but it'll get it close. And actually, hand me the panty. Is, do you see the panty up there? So if I was doing this um, for a higher layer, and, and earlier we talked about tomorrow, we're gonna pack more in at the sides. If you were doing this for a higher layer, measure that layer, right? Measure your panty and go, that's 34 inches. You would want this to end up like 38 to 40 when it's done so that you can put your center back on 
without scrunching any, put your front on without scrunching any, and then over their hips, you're gonna ease on extra fabric. But this little gizmo usually doesn't get it close enough. And this one doesn't handle doubling a layer as well. It will, let's try it with a little bit. It will double it, but as you double it, it gets less full. So I know um, a couple folks also that use this because it's what they've got and what's available. They'll double their layers with this. Then they'll finish it off by zigzagging over a string because think about it, this is scrunched it down and you're not zigzagging over in a string that's five widths of 54. You're just zigzagging over a string that's like 48 inches. So you can kind of ruffle it and then use the zigzag over a string to get it even smaller. So lots of options. And this little gizmo is the thing that's more likely to go and get bent and jammed up and cause you grief. Okay, the last one I'm going to show you is kind of zigzagging over a string, but a little more controlled. So I know that this works on a Bernina. I don't know what foot you would use on your machine. Um, but the Bernina has a foot with three toes. It's a button. It's like a manual buttonhole foot to make an, a buttonhole the hard way. And it has these three toes. So I'm going to put my, my number three foot on and make a zigzag, kind of a wide zigzag, medium length. Then say my piece of panty is 32 inches and I want that extra to pack over her hip. I'm going to make a loop that's like 34 to 38 inches. So I'm not measuring this, but you can measure yours. So if you make a loop, like you're going to play cat's cradle, actually take your two cut ends of the thread or twine or string, whatever you're using, tie them together, put your safety pin on that, or actually what I'm going to do is just catch my loop. So you have a set length of, of loop here. Put your net in there, and you're going to put the loop behind your sewing machine. I should put a safety pin on there, but that's all right. Put a safety pin on the end of your loop. Put your whole loop folded in half behind the machine, and then you put your loop on the middle toe. So I've got a loop here, and my foot has a middle toe. I think you can also make this work with there's a Bernina foot to put a button on. I think that would work. It has like a weird toe in the middle. So I'm holding my loop, and then I'm lowering my foot, and then I start my zigzagging, and the loop is just going to start to scrunch the netting up. So if I start to hold the back of my loop, I can just, I can like scrunch it a little bit if I want, or I can let it get to the end of my loop. I can let, let's just say my loop is shorter. I'm going to shorten my loop. Oh, I tied a slip knot. How would I do that? Then, eventually your fabric will have no choice but to start to gather up. And you just keep working it down your loop. So that's pretty cool. So if your loop is only the length you need, you kind of just keep arranging as you go and it can't get longer than your loop. So it's like zigzagging over the independent thread or fishing line, but you're already controlling the length. And for this too, definitely put a safety pin in the middle so that you know that you wanna kind of zhuzh the same amount to either side of your safety pin. Okay, okay, okay. Let's see. We should ruffle a layer, two layers, and actually put a couple things on the panty, I think. I'm going to ruffle over there. And I don't think my microphone's going to reach, but what I, oh, it might. It might. Um, let's find out. So we're going to, we're using our ruffling machine, which is 
a modified Gorin, G-O-R-I-N, pleater, but ours is from the Imperial Sewing Company, which might not even exist anymore. But there is a company in Europe, D-O-W-L-I-N-G, Dowling. If you look up Dowling pleaters, you can get a modern version of our machine. I would say don't get one unless you think you're making tons of tutus because they're expensive. And ours is so old, we have to be like the repair guy for it. So until we, you know, can't continue to fix it, knock on wood, um, you know, it's serving us pretty well. I'm going to get my layer one and two and my three and four, maybe. I'm so close. I'm so close. One and two and three and four is over here. I was playing with four. I know. The ruffling machine is just somewhere to hold crap. Um, so the, our ruffling machine uh, works well enough to not have to, other than the hoop layer, we're not stitching the layers together. Can you grab me a chair? We're going to make this. It's going to happen. The chair is coming. The chair is coming. The chair. Okay. I don't want to change the settings on the chair. It's like the most stressful part of our day. Um, but we searched this out and got it because um, we make a lot of tutus. Um, but you don't need this machine. Absolutely, you don't need it. But it's doing kind of what we were doing earlier by hand. And I have a, we have different discs that do, so I'm changing the disc just so you know if you're using it for ruffles. Rick, they're making skirts, clown skirts. So we have, actually, you might even be able to look for a Gorin pleater. If you called silver sewing in LA, they might have a Gorin pleater. Huh. Oh, we disconnected the camera. Is it back? Give us just a minute. We got too far away. We're in a holding pattern. They can see me? Can you guys see him? Is it for you? I don't think it's Can you guys see me? Yeah. Yes. Oh, good. We just unplugged the camera for a second. Um, but so this machine is doing mechanically what I was doing over there with the chopstick yesterday or the fork or my hands. Um, you could check to see if Imperial Sewing is still cranking these out in New Jersey, and by cranking out, I mean it took me four years for them to find two of them so that they could cobble them back together to make one that works. But there is the new uh, version of it out of London, a dowling pleater. And there might even be a version in the States now. They use them to make the ribbons for race horse, horses in Europe, and ours is what's used to make the um, ruffle on a Russell Stouffer's candy box. But we had a gear made for tutus that does like a six to one ratio. So I'm going to just feed my one and two in and ruffle them. And it makes just a handsome ruffle like it came from a store. But when I first started, we were gathering, doing gathering stitches. And then the Johnson Ruffler came around, which is like a curse and a blessing. So you can kind of start to see the colors are fun. So this is one and two, and then I'm gonna do the same to three and four. And we cut this much longer than we needed just because we didn't want to fold another packet just for the short layers. So you'll see I'm going to be chucking some. And really, if I kind of knew in my head how much extra I don't need, I would just cut it off right here and say I'm good to go.
and see here too, you can see the bottom of it moves it through faster. And this is a chain stitch machine. So that means it can't be left without something underneath the needle. So we just use crepe paper. And really we just stick the next ruffle in and just keep going, but I'm gonna use the crepe paper so I can quickly see the difference between my one and two and my three and four, even though you can see it anyway. Now I'm gonna do three and four, and then we're gonna leave today by me getting this much onto the panty. I like to put the bigger one on the bottom, but sometimes it doesn't work out that way. This, the color's even gonna be more stripy than the top. But once it's all done, it'll have a watercolor feeling to it. It's still a little damp. My five wants to flip over, but I'm not going to let it. My microphone cord is making this a little more challenging. We tried this once with three, it was too much. Getting there. And I'm picking everything that's on the floor up too. It's just gonna be texture in the tutu. Some string, some thread, dryer lint, dog hair. my edges match, stick some crepe paper in there so it's not unthreaded for the next guy. All right, we're gonna go to the industrial machine and sew this much on. Okay, it's a dance. So we've got much more length than we needed here. Because I, like I said earlier, I cut this out with five widths of 54, and we're just throwing away the extra. You could also measure four widths of 54 and get a little more precise. Um, but we're always thinking about, like, you know, speed, stuff like that. Um, I'm going to take my panty. I have a purple bobbin, but this lovely young lady is never going to look on the inside. Do I have another bobbin? No, I'm self-conscious about my bobbin choices. Um, so everything will just be covered with thread. If there's a serger in the room, your ruffle will just grab the serger thread and drag it across the planet. Um, I am gonna do red really quick. Now is a good time for a couple questions if you've got them. Tomorrow will be have some more layers attached to talk about what we did and then we're going to connect the bosque and do some um, airbrushing also and tacking and everybody will get this video the from the last time so you'll have like a refresher that i'll send out today but i don't know for sure when this one will be ready Why won't my machine kick over? You know, it won't. There it goes. 
my clutch was stuck on the motor. I'm sewing this with red because we're going to put little red low lights in this with the airbrush. So you can also experiment like, do you feel like you want to do the long layers first, the short layers first? I say for sure try it both ways because some people just take better to one than the other it's just your call and also the equipment is different too like on the industrial machine there's enough room here that i could i could do it either way i just prefer going short to long um because i find when i go long to short i have a hard time keeping my short layer nice and lined up from one side of the panty to the other because i'm wrestling with everything so I'm going to go short to long, long. And I'm actually going to start with three and four instead of two and three, just because I already know that is what works better for me. Boy, I'm blind. And we like to put them on with a, like a medium zigzag. And remember that the back of your panty is going to have a seam in it. So if we look at our, our panty, of which I never trim the threads, a good dyeing note too, right? Um, we're using thread that's poly cotton blend, so it doesn't dye at all. It just stays white. I should have sewed this with thread that matches um, what, I'm, what I'm dyeing it to, and I did not. So I'm going to start actually, so we're going to do, when we say this is my hip and my crotch between my legs is to the right, so the girl's torso is to the left, and you'll hear us refer to layers up and layers down. An up layer, we say, is when the majority of the netting is facing up. It's going up towards the body. A down layer is when the netting is facing down. So I'm going to put on three and four so layers three and four are going on row two on the panty and layers one and two are going on row one on the panty because we doubled it you can also make a separate line for each single layer of the tutu but know that you're going to have to really squish things in over the hips and i know some folks when they're putting their seam allowance over the hips to get it to squish better they actually trim down the seam allowance over the hips so that's something you can you can play with and think about but I am right now, I'm going to do three and four up and one and two up. And then we're going to put later five, six, seven, and eight all facing down. So our initial layers are going to go up. Our next layers are going to go down. And you can also do them up, down, up, down, you know, but we're, we're doubling this. So I'm going to rip out my crepe paper from the ruffler. And... I need to make sure that I don't have netting going into the seam allowance of the center back. So you've got to leave this blank runway uh, where the panty is going to get seamed up. Because if we put netting all the way to there, we're going to have a really lumpy, lumpy seam. And when I start, I like to put the tiniest little fold. You don't want to fold a whole bunch back because then the butt's going to get huge. I just like to fold like a quarter inch or a half an inch of netting over. And I'm going to center that on my line. And I'm going to, so I'm not on the first line. I'm on the second line. Just because that's over time how I've decided I like to do it. Because the first one tends to roll and twist. So I find if I put the second one on, I have more luck with putting the first one on. And this thing that's cut way too long, we're just going to lay it down and chop off the extra. Because I was using five widths for my four. So I'm gonna just arrange this and I'm gonna just lay it on. 
The industrial machine is nice too because you're able to lift the foot up with your knee and it's easier to arrange stuff. And I used wax tracing paper to make my lines really show up so that when I dyed it, I didn't lose my lines. And some folks like to stitch all the lines with a zigzag first, which is totally fine. Or if you think you're gonna, if you're a heavy handed sewer, you could stitch your higher up lines with a straight stitch to keep the panty from growing. But once all this netting is on here, it takes up quite a bit of abuse for the panty to grow. So I'm just keeping sure that I'm following my second line. And my one and two are gonna go really close to the leg elastic, so I have to make sure I don't sew over my leg elastic. And you'll remember yesterday we fed our leg elastic in before um, we started putting the netting on because, so I'm gonna just cut off what I don't need. And I'm gonna fold over a tiny bit at the end. I'm gonna just unruffle a little bit so I have a nice piece to fold over. I want my ruffling thread to get hidden in there. So having the elastic in now is just great. It's just great. So now I'm gonna go back and put one and two on. Just cause I found that that's the way I do it. I imagine you're, you're, we all do it a little different. It just kind of depends. And you'll see too, depending on like how many you're making and you know if you wanna stay engaged, you might just switch it up a little bit every time. So I'm folding over just like a half an inch. And now I wanna make sure I don't go into the center back at the beginning and the end. I have to leave that inch-ish seam allowance. And again, you don't have to double. We just do because it works well for our situation. So now I wanna make sure, like I wanna make sure that something isn't going weird with the panty. Like I almost had a pucker there. So I'm gonna just keep it arranged really nice. And even though, you know, um, measuring out all that netting seems like more work, you're saving yourself time here. We didn't have to put seams in it. We also did not have to, you know, ruffle a whole bunch of separate bits and then join them or join them and then ruffle them. Yeah down the road, I think they just last a little bit longer without all those seams in it. And the only time I'm going to really start pinning is when I've got the layers that we're going to scrunch on. So later today, I'm going to put a couple more layers on, but we'll leave a few off so we can show you how we're scrunching them. Um, that's when we'll use a couple pins because we want to know where the middle is. We want to know where the sides are. Um, but I have more success for these shorter ones where we're not putting all the netting on. I have more success just using my hands to line it up as I go. And if you're thinking about getting a new sewing machine, at least try out an industrial. They're just so much easier to make tutus with. And so there I fold it under a little bit again. And I've stayed clear from my center back seam allowance. I'm reversing on the ruffle and then reversing at the edge of the seam allowance. So we are on the way to having a tutu. We're going to put, so we're going to go like the top half is where we're going to scrunch. So I've got one and two, three and four. 
I'm going to put five and six on without scrunching. Then seven, eight, nine, ten, and eleven, all the fabric we're going to scrunch on. So my seven, eight, and nine, and ten are five widths of five. So we'll be packing some more over the hips. And then the piece that Rick is working on we is six. So there's going to be even more to squish in. But we're going to do the chop stick, chop stick thing on Rick's layer to see how it turns out. And then we're going to airbrush some into here and then start connecting our bosque and tacking it. So we have a lot to do tomorrow, but I think we can do it in two hours. So thank you, everybody. That's where we're going to end today. I'll right now send everybody the link of part two last time and expect that it's a little bit different, but it's a good, it's a good review. And when it's all done, we'll send you six links that have both times we've done it all smashed together. And actually the people that took it the last time, we will um, refine their emails and send them the classroom this time because that's how we do things. That's it. Thank you. Um, I got a lot of people's panty patterns out. A few folks are new to getting patterns from us. They come from mailbigfile.com, and you can download it with Adobe Acrobat Reader and print it poster size at 100% and tape it together or take it to a printer. And on our Facebook page, there's a video showing how that works, too. And if you haven't sent your panty requests, you may still do that at any time. Okay, goodbye. Thank y'all. I need some water. You can use this too. Just use the ruffler. Yeah, just put the two disc back on because I took it off. Yeah, use the ruffler. He'll show you how to start and stop. You guys all had lunch, yeah? yeah. Oh, good. What is this? What? Let me show you.